Okay, Meeta, welcome to the show. I'm so glad we're doing this after having some scheduling issues for the past couple of months. But thank you so much for cooperating with that schedule problem, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. I love that we've settled on a lovely Friday evening to do this. There's it's always a wonderful time to talk about literature and books and reading, um, especially in this screen adult age, if I may put it like that. Um, it's it, it does feel like a bit of a throwback to be talking about reading and literature, but it also feels so much more concrete um, as, I, as I was putting this episode together. Let me ask, let me get started by asking you about the JCB Prize, Mita. Now, the JCB Prize has been around since 2018. Um, mm -hmm. You've been at the helm for the past two and a half. I think this is your third edition. Tell us a little bit about this prize. Um, tell us why it's special. See, it's the JCB Prize is probably the largest and the most prestigious. And uh, also, I think it serves a purpose for India because it actually seeks to mirror contemporary India. It seeks to tell stories from our India today. Mm -hmm. And when I say today, it obviously goes back to a few decades because, you know, the definition of contemporary can is, is very subjective. Mm -hmm. But uh, what the prize does is that it seeks to reach out to publishers across the country from different states to encourage them to be participative, to encourage them to seriously look at sending their books as entries. Um, and the one strength that we have is that we put books written originally in English, as well as books that are translated from other languages into English at this, on the same grid. There is absolutely no differentiation. For us, mm -hmm. what the common denominator is that the, the story and the book has to stand on its own. It has to have a measure of excellence, whether it's the voice or the characters or the story, what it's trying to say, how, you know, whether it's experimenting with genre. All of that comes into play when we are looking at the JCB Prize. So in that sense, I think the prize is extremely, truly, democratically, representative of what our country is love it i think just the aspiration to be truly representative of india is super ambitious right uh, it is a diverse country we've got so many different literary traditions we've got so many diverse voices coming through how how have, how have you operationalized that um, ambition i'd love to dive a little bit deeper in trying to understand uh, the process of putting to get, putting this together. So it's actually not as complicated as people think it's going to be. You just have to, one, have your nose to the ground, know mm -hmm. what publishers are working on. Uh, we, in spite of the fact that everybody thinks that, you know, the price just kind of plays out on its own. There's a lot of back-end work that goes behind putting it together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have to have a stalwart jury in place, first of right. all, because they are the decision-making masters. Uh, they have to be from different fields. Again, this whole thing of being representative also applies to the jury, whether it's languages, whether it's regions, whether it's their their own career trajectory, you know, whether mm -hmm. they've made a mark in the field that they belong to. Apart from that, we, de we are dependent totally on our publishers, whether they are mainstream, they're large houses, or they're independent small publishers. They don't have to be from a particular city. It's from anywhere in the country. So mm -hmm. the challenge, what we have taken on ourselves, and we are progressing very, very, I would say, uh, not at a very frantic pace, but at a very steady pace and reaching out to all sorts of publishers and making them aware that this prize exists for all storytellers, right. for all fiction writers. Uh, obviously, we don't take short stories or things like that. But the, according to the rules of the prize, we are open and available for all kinds of entries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so once the 
publishers send in their entries, then obviously the internal processes start and you reach a long list and then a short list and then you reach the winning book. Uh, I'm just trying to encapsulate a very complicated process in two, three simple sentences. Absolutely. Um, but yes, it has to, you know, and when you asked me when, uh, when I took over as director, the desire was to, as I said, make it as inclusive, as representative, as broad in scope as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we let publishers know that we are looking even within literary fiction, we're looking at other genres because then, right. then, that, then you give scope for novelists and writers to experiment. And that's exactly what we want. We want to see that next strong voice. What is it that they are trying to say through their stories? Right. How is it reflective of what's happening in India today? And the most important pillar, I think, is we, we want it to also, the prize has to be about what India loves to read. Right. It's not about what, it's, it's obviously about what publishers are sending us, mm -hmm. but even we are trying to get this dialogue started where we are saying that this is fine. You've taken these books, but what is it that our readers are saying to us? Are we creating new readerships? Are we converting more people to love books? Mm -hmm. Like you just said that we are living in a screen adult age. Um, but I really still aspire to fulfilling that dream where I know uh, that, you know, this is what our readers have come back with. And what are we going to do about it? I'm How is it. it reflective of their aspirations? What is What are the kind of stories they are looking for? And are our writers rising up to that occasion? Whether it's in our languages or whether it's done in, in English, it doesn't matter. It's just that we are a country of where I think we are selling, we're sitting on so many, many, many stories that are still mm -hmm. to be told. How are we making them reach publishers? How are we making them reach our readers? So some the price kind of sits there, you know, very mm -hmm. large in its ambition. And plus we are only five, we are five years old this year. Right. So, so the effort is also to ensure that it grows year by year. Uh, so the dream and the vision is to ensure that um, 10 years hence, it did the JCB prize is looked upon as the institution. Like it's, it is the thing in India mm -hmm. for, for writers. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, let me ask you this. And it's very interesting that you talked about big or small publishers, independent publishers. There is a, there is a bias towards the charts always, right? Um, books that have sold books that have, done PR cycles um, tend to dominate mind space, right? Mm -hmm. When you're setting out to represent Indian writing in the way that you are with the JCB Prize, there are obviously lots of voices that have not seen the, the kind of readership, uh, the kind of circulation, the kind of numbers um, that maybe some of the top titles from top publishers have seen, right? How do you then try and balance that, that out? Have, have you encountered... Um, that situation where there's been a couple of titles that are pushing the boundaries of writing, but were just not part of the PR buzz or PR cycle, uh, coming up against maybe a stalwart name with, with a new title out. Um, how do you balance that out? See, uh, that's the whole point, right? When the entries come in, the jury's reading. Now, the jury mm -hmm. doesn't consider who's the publisher. Right. So it's not about, nobody has that, none, no, I, I don't think any of my juries in these three years have ever bothered to see which book has a more, more of a PR buzz around it or has the author a little more status and recognition mm -hmm. in terms of media presence or whatever other kind of social media presence. Uh, the focus entirely is on the writing, on the mm -hmm. storytelling. And uh, that's exactly how we function. We function with that single-minded focus. So it doesn't, it, it's not a criteria for the jury at all as to, you know, 
is that Selecting. person up there or not? No, right. the focus is entirely on the writing. Love there it. are times uh, when they even lose track of who published which book because as it is, you're reading so many entries, right? You're reading so right. many books. So where is the... Uh, and also, I think there, um, the my job as a literary director is to ensure that. And right. I'm quite a taskmaster when it comes to that. <laughs> I mean, I, think... I know I know my jury all from all three years will vouch for this if they hear this podcast. That oh my god, she really makes us work hard. <laughs> so I'm, I have I'm absolutely do. no doubt that, in that. Yeah, that's the touchstone of of um, of an award that needs to be taken seriously, right? You have to have uh, the integrity and and the eye for detail and and the eye for excellence that that you're setting out for. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, Meeta. How has the JCB Prize impacted the career or the trajectory of writers that you've rewarded? What what kind of uh, support, what kind of uh, ecosystem does the prize bring bring with it? I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples while I was uh, doing my research. I learned that uh, a couple of authors who, who won the award in, in previous years were for the first time converted to had their books converted to audio right there was distribution support that you brought to the table as well so it's not just uh you know a sizable monetary prize or the prestige of winning it but it's also uh, a lot of support that you bring to the table i'd love to know a little bit more about about how you do that see you know uh it's for me and for the team at the jcb prize it's not just about and the jury, of course, selecting mm -hmm. the long list and then going on to the short list and then the winner. It's also about promoting and making sure that these books are recognized and that it translates into something sizable and tangible for our authors. Mm -hmm. So let me start with, let's say, we are the only prize, I think, that really, really sincerely promotes our long listed authors. Right. and their books so whether it's various collaborations with different kind of organizations um or more media uh, opportunities uh, whether it's interviews features or it's college visits or university visits or participation in festivals um anything and everything we really work every year on promoting our long list uh, and that itself, I think, helps authors and their books to um, be more visible. And we have seen a definite positive impact, mm -hmm. not just on the shortlist and the winning books, but also in our longlisted titles. Each of our authors has come back and said, oh, we were approached by so-and-so maybe for a screen adaptation. Oh, my book is getting translated now into this uh, couple of other Indian languages. Oh, I've been offered a international contract. So I'm not reeling off specific names and titles because then mm -hmm. our, in, you know, it will get like, again, too technical, but literally we've done an impact analysis this year on the last four years. And we've realized that it's sales figures, it's visibility, it's other opportunities that have come the way, have gone the way for uh, towards all longlisted and shortlisted and winning book uh, book titles. Uh, so the prize definitely has worked alongside just selecting the lists and the titles, etc. There are lots of promotion things that we do, which make sure that our books remain in the news. Love it. I think it's um, a wonderful encapsulation of, of what you mentioned. It's also something that points to me, uh, points out to me that being a writer today, and whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, is not just a a static job where you're hammering out words on uh, on a computer or or a typewriter. I mean, for people who like it analog, um, it's also putting your voice out there for other opportunities, like you said, right? Um, I keep speaking to folks from the video or audio entertainment industries and they talk about the dearth of writers right and there's definite demand for accomplished writers storytellers who have an eye for for yeah. detail. are you seeing that happen as well uh published authors getting opportunities with video with audio to get their stories out there a lot more than maybe 10 15 years ago has that scenario changed is that a pull that that you're experiencing as well 
Absolutely. And it's changed quite for the better, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at some stage, the pandemic did contribute to it as well. Sure. Um, we, we've had we've had our challenges because of that. Uh, but opening up of new medium mm-hmm. to tell stories has actually burgeoned in the last few years and more so in the last three or four years. So writers are getting pulled into writing screenplays, into podcasts, into uh, audiobooks, uh, into other digital medium uh, mediums uh, to express themselves, to write their stories. Um, so the I think it's opened up quite a plethora of opportunities. Which is fantastic because, you know, what happens sometimes is that every book, and I'm not talking about the JCB books right now, I'm talking Mm -hmm. in general, every book sometimes maybe is not meant for print publishing. Right. So that doesn't mean that the world ends there for that author. Now that author knows that she has an opportunity to convert it into an audio book, to probably put it out on Wattpad and see who picks it up from there. Um, look at serializing it in a podcast, gather your followers from there, or just probably converting it into a screen, uh, into a web series or something. So storytelling has, um, there's a lot more flexibility, there's a lot more room for exploring, and there's Mm -hmm. a lot for room for even honing your own strength as a writer. So every time you dabble with something new, or you experiment, you grow. And if an artist gets that opportunity to grow and evolve, I think it only adds to this particular skill set that that writer is exercising, whether it's writing for audio, whether it's writing for print, whether it's writing for film or web series or whatever. So there is opportunity for growth, for evolving, and that's exactly what every writer needs. Like at the end of every day, I should have felt that yesterday I've learned this, I have grown. You know, so that evolving curve has to be there. And yes, these opportunities are there. So it's a very good time for us to be in, for our writers. Content is king right now. And you know that better than anybody else. Uh, I I mean, I know that the demand for content is king at this point. Um, Content itself, I think, is, is going through a very interesting period. And I think what you said... Uh, forms the backbone of it, right? The demand for great stories and the opportunities for people creating great stories is just at an all-time high. But that brings me to my next question, which is which kind of ties into into Siahi as well, right? A lot of writers that I meet um, just want to tell stories, right? And their in their mind, pehla padao, the first milestone that they want is I just want to get published, right? Will someone take my story and put it out there? Will take someone take my story, screenplay and turn it into something, right? Um, how equipped do you think are, are young writers who come to you? How equipped do you think uh, they are? Um, how aware are they with about all the possibilities that that are around them? And and what kind of role does does a, a company like Siahi then play in molding that? I, I'd love to understand. How you deal with these young writers who have, you know, all of this inspiration, all of these great stories there, but they may not know enough about the world right now. How do you how do you work with that? So it's a mixed bag. I'll be very honest. Some writers mm-hmm. come to me, uh, with, you know, they've they've been around for a while. They're writing new books, so obviously their writing styles have evolved. Their research is fantastic. The weaving of that research unobtrusively into the narrative, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, it goes both ways, mm-hmm. is all there, you know, and they're constantly working on honing that skill set as well. There are some writers who are obviously unaware mm-hmm. of how to do things, of how to approach their writing, of how to structure their books, of how to work with the creative stylistic expression to even when if they're writing fiction for how the plot should move from point A to point B to point C, handling the narrative arc, character development, the voice, the experimenting with literary traditions. If that so-called plot needs some research, how sincere Mm. are you about it? And there are some writers who are very, very receptive, like they're like sponges. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are some who are in so much of a hurry to get published 
that uh, that becomes a little um, I'm just trying to be polite yes it 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 just taxes my patience a bit <laughs> uh, but what we we do normally is that every submission yeah, he gets feedback on the first initial chapters like we take three sample chapters uh, as our initial submission and we do give quite a bit of feedback on each submission even if we are not interested in taking that book forward wow that's such wonderful and laborious but such a wonderful effort uh, on your part i think um i read somewhere about your process i think you take uh, i'm not sure if you still do this but you take non fiction for the rest of the no. month while between 10th and 15th of the month you take big fiction pitches right and and um this other rule that i that i'm going to definitely try and imbibe in my own life is that you reply to emails within 24 hours yes uh, i do in fact there's uh, my actually the thing is i have my team to credit mm -hmm. they are the ones who are working reading constantly not that i'm not reading so am i but we are all working together mm -hmm. so it's it's never like in i'm not sitting in one silo and doing my works in like a solitary person no it's it's right. a lot of team work that comes into play here and i don't think i can function without them and their madness and their commitment um having said that um yeah we do we do try, we do answer emails and if if i'm getting a little late then i kind of put it on my notes on my phone that oh we didn't like i have to write back just the name of that person gets noted so i have to write back like the last 3 days i've been traveling i've been on three different flights but mm -hmm. the first thing i did in the morning was uh, and it's it's actually sheer habit before i start any creative works it, it work it's like and it's a rule in the office is that we all go through our emails first so something urgent needs to be done something needs to be replied to but yes sometimes at 24 hours i'll be honest to admit extends to 36 but i'm i get very very antsy about it and that is one point where i actually get angry that no we can't do this we can't let our writers down mm -hmm. and it simply comes from one belief that if i've sent something to somebody and they haven't responded to me i feel very uneasy i said what is that person thinking i'm curious why haven't mm -hmm. they replied so i don't want to put other people in that same situation you know i love it i think it's it's super respectful <coughs> it Excuse me. also um it also shows how your experience of being across the table um feeds back into your work as an agent i'm going to go into a quick break um on the other side we'll talk about how you choose authors we'll talk about your books um and we'll talk about um, how you expect young authors to package themselves when they're pitching pitching themselves to you uh go nowhere this is a fan fascinating conversation with meeta kapoor uh we'll be back right after these messages hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network on cock and bull Cyrus Navin and Shriram talk about the upcoming football world cup in Qatar and hiring of fake fans for the tournament. On Warta Lab, Akash and Navin are joined by illustrator and muralist Neeti. They talk about how she started off in the art space. On a niche thing, Anish talks to Joseph Radik, celebrity wedding photographer and global imaging ambassador of Sony. They talk about the advancements in phone photography and tips to take better pictures. On Polya Bazi, Saurabh Khyati and Pranay talk to Ashik Ahmed Iqbal about his new book, The Aeroplane and the Making of Modern India. And on the longest constitution, Priya continues to decode the Gundas Act and how it is used extensively. Once again, don't forget to visit our merch store on ivmpodcast.com. We have some exciting stuff for you over there. Follow us on social media. We are IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you like our show, spread the word. Tell your friends and don't forget to rate and review them wherever you're listening. You'll also find our shows on YouTube at youtube.com/ivmpodcasts. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week: Bumble, Heads Up for Tales, Kotak Privy League Program, and HDFC Mutual Fund. Thank you for making this possible. And we're back. This is Storytellers and Story Sellers. I'm Vineet Kanabar. You're listening to me talk to Meeta Kapoor about. writing in india um before we went into the break we were talking about meeta's 
literary consultancy se aahi uh, we were talking about how they're helping authors develop a voice or give detailed feedback on manuscripts they receive me i want to ask you uh, at the top of this section how do you pick uh, authors to work with what what must stand out to you and i'm, I'm when i say you i mean siahi and you uh, specifically as well what do you look for when someone writes uh, writes in to you right um in, uh, we'll talk we'll cover the stylistic artistic elements first and then maybe talk about the packaging elements um of of a successful pitch but yeah the stylistic elements what do you look for i actually i sound very idealistic when i say it but i'm still greedy when right. i open every manuscript submission because i'm still always looking for that new voice a fresh approach what is it that they have to say that greed hasn't finished mm-hmm. um so yeah i still want to fall in love with the writing so the first few sentences of every submission that comes to me has to really hook me right there so if you are starting with a cliched kind of beginning you kind of lose me a bit mm-hmm. if you're starting with um, if i get a sense oh you're thinking in your mother tongue but you're writing in english you lose me completely right and that happens a lot um uh, and obviously i want to see where the story is going whether it's fiction non fiction uh non fiction obviously i want to see the fluidity of narrative research how convincing is it um what other books are there in the same genre because mm-hmm. uh, and that goes for fiction as well um uh, basically yes i have to be just very very convinced that yes i want right. to read the rest of the chapters yeah and the so stylistically creatively yes the book has to speak to me i have to get hooked it i'm i'm giving you very general terms and sure. i think people who are going to listen to this podcast will say ye to hame bhi malum hai that we have to hook but i you know it's just something that instinctively i want to read ahead right i want that appeal coming to me you want to it's turn the very- page you don't want to stop right there and and hold off yeah and one does that pretty often i must say mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh you know and uh, it's also how you package yourself what your synopsis reads like though most of i think 99.9% i don't bother to read the synopsis even if i ask for it right neither do i open the profile of the writer i don't i go straight to the document right uh, because i want to approach it with an absolutely blank mind that's something that i'm very particular about mm-hmm. but uh, somewhere uh you know what puts me off is when writers kind of are writing to 10 other agents and 10 other publishers and they're all cc'd or bcc'd on that email right that's just not done that's not professional at all that means you really don't care you're showing right. a lot of disrespect uh, to each one of us with due mm-hmm. respect to everyone else also i'm saying the least you can do is know whom you're writing to right if i get an email addressed to me as dear sir hmm. my first my first instinct is to delete it right that means you don't even know with whom you're writing to like what what have you researched whom are you writing to who is the right. literary agent and then your cover note at least like be sure of how you're putting yourself across what are you saying to the agent mm-hmm. you know, all of that kind of it helps you stand apart obviously the only thing that helps you stand apart is what you've written in your book 100% For sure. but this also gives you a sense of you know how serious or committed uh, how, how knowledgeable that particular writer is you know yes. you're expecting me as a as as a creative person to respect your creativity when you send mm-hmm. your submission i am going to show you that respect okay that is why every email every submission gets answered to that hey listen i'm going to get back in so much time thanks for writing to us blah 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 but i need that thing to be mutual right i have had people send me submissions as screenshots oh wow 
and i'm like you know you can be a gen z or millennial or whatever whatever other titles you have for this generation i'm sorry some things you've got to remain rooted in ground and don't forget your polities at least have the decency to go through my submission guidelines and read them carefully and just yeah. abide by it it's the same amount of effort no screenshot lene mein bhi to effort lagta hai bilkul that kind of really puts you off but oh well it takes all sorts of people i don't want to go you know just raving and ranting about what people don't do but what keeps us going is when i see submissions land in my inbox every day that means people still have faith in us that means people are still looking for us to give feedback mm -hmm. that means i can continue searching for that next beautiful book you know Love it. and and my faith is still absolutely steadfast i think it's it's very interesting that you point out these things um which are which should really be de rigueur but the lack of those point to maybe the kind of author you might be dealing with if someone's not um research oriented enough to look at what kind of literary agent they are pitching to hey is there someone who does my kind of thing or am i just doing a mailing list to them or if someone's not uh detail oriented enough to go through your submission guidelines does that i mean in your experience also sometimes come through in the work or or am i connecting two dots that are not really connected no you would be surprised there are some creative people who actually are so absent minded that they just kind of like i've got submissions just as attachments no subject line just the attachment right right and it amuses me but i always in my head try and make room for that and say okay maybe too creative too eccentric might mm -hmm. just be a genius you never know sure so give it a fair chance sure yeah i get it yep and um, sometimes we get hate mail also by the way <laughs> which which yeah. actually tells me that i'm doing things right yeah i think uh, as long as you uh, don't have a few haters out there uh it doesn't feel like feel like you're doing your job right i guess um let me ask you this meeta um once you get a writer on board right you've you've found um someone who in your opinion is is a fresh voice someone who you want to take on board what happens then right um from the outsider's perspective the world of publishing and then publishing and distribution is super tough to get into um super difficult to find, um, from an outsider's perspective right i mean it it is a uh, a circle that is uh, that is that seems close from from the out, from the outside perspective right i'm i'm i mean i'm now 35 and i've lived in bombay 15 years so i know my way around a little bit but when i was 17 or 18 and if you told me how do i go and get a book published i'm a boy out of nagpur um how do you go and get a book published i'd say just make a pdf and self publish on the internet because that's the information that was available to me at that time right and now i'm i might have a different point of view uh, no people but what happens when you get the writer on board um and you decide to take them to market right what's the process there like so basically when we see potential in a book we work very creatively with the author we give feedback we we get them to you know kind of revise rewrite whatever needs to be done for that every book is treated differently mm -hmm. depending on what the book is about so our approach changes with every book yeah but technically yes we start off with first signing the cie authors contract putting their right. profiles and pictures and blurbs of the book on our website so that people know and they also need to feel welcome so they need to feel part of the cie family and that is something that we are very particular about looking after our authors as well as humanly possible mm -hmm. i do make mistakes no doubt but i try we try we all try our best uh, so that happens and the creative feedback and the revision happens where we feel comfortable that this book has reached that point that yes we can pitch it out to publishers we create a professional pitch we lies with publishers we speak to them to an appropriate list of editors in mm -hmm. you know because you just can't send it books randomly we know which editors looking for what what genres they're working on so depending on that we send the book out and then obviously the whole process of getting their offers in getting their contracts vetted so we work on every clause of every contract we get things changed we 
we are may always making sure that the author's rights are constantly protected, looked after. Uh, and also saying that, that makes me sound as if I'm against publishers. I'm not. I'm always sitting on the fence and making sure that both sides are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we handhold through the editing process in the set publishing house, whether the book jacket is getting designed, what's happening with marketing, post-marketing, what else is the author capable of doing. So we, we get into uh, translations, we get into international submissions, we get into audio stuff, we get into um, film adaptations. So we do all of that work starts panning out. Sometimes simultaneously, sometimes not. It depends. And as, as I said, again, each book is treated because it requires a special treatment. Right. You, there is no general, like there is no template for me to, okay, I'm ticking off from the checklist and saying, Achha, ye ho gaya, ye ho gaya. Aise nahi hota hai. Right. We go book by book. and But generally, just speaking, that's what happens when we take over. And we are obviously like, I was at the Frankfurt Book Fair uh, this year, after a gap of three years, um, pitching my books, my the rights for my authors, various books to different editors, different publishers, mm -hmm. working with my sub agents in different countries, catching up with them. So a lot of stuff happens simultaneously all the time. So it's always a multi-pronged approach. Right. And is there, right at the genesis of, of taking a book to market, is there a plan for, hey, this is going to be, uh, you know, the literary rights, we're going to look at audio rights separately. Um, there is an opportunity or possibility of pitching this for the screen. So we'll we'll look at those differently. Or or is this still um, sort of amorphous, sort of together? Uh, how, how are you approaching this? Or how is it being approached as we step into like this new decade of, of uh, you know, it, internet content? It, it can't be amorphous because, you know, if I've if I've picked a book, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'll give you a recent example. It's a debut author, very strong book, um, a little too strong, I think. It kind of made me shudder a bit when I was reading it. Uh, I still have to pitch it out to publishers, still getting the pitch ready and you know, signing on the contract, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I did have a meeting with a film rights person today, like somebody who was shopping for books. And they mentioned, you know, we are looking for XYZ kind of plot and story. And immediately that book came to my mind. So even before finding a print publisher, I immediately launched into a bit of a storyline for that book and, mm -hmm. you know, s said something about the characters, the plot, etc. And they said, oh, this sounds really exciting. Can you send it to us? And I said, yeah, sure enough. So it's it's not that, as I said, I don't have a set template. I go with the strength of every book. Mm -hmm. If a certain book will demand that, you know, this needs to be printed and published first, and then we look at the rest of it. Some books kind of just go simultaneously. I always believe that every book comes with its own pulse. There's something living about a book, I think. Right. Uh, and I always say, you know, and especially even if a book is getting delayed and the, and the author or the publisher, either or, are fretting, Ki, oh, oh, this has got delayed by so many months. And I tell them, I said, it will happen when it has to happen. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Don't try and push it. Let's just keep working. That's all. So there is, there is um, not a set registered path, so to say. Right. What we do is we try our best to do justice to the content of every book. Love it. Let me ask you this last bit about uh, new books coming to market. Do you look at audio books differently from uh, books that are going to print? Is there a shorthand for in your experience that has emerged saying, hey, this seems like it will do really well in audio or maybe we'll do better in audio? Um, I'm asking you this because if you go by any uh, industry research that's happening, there are about 100 million people who listen to audiobooks in a year in India, which is an obscenely large number for any other country apart from India. In India, it's less than, it's about like 8% of people. Um, but 
that's a massive market, right? And I'm um, pretty sure that as we have, as we've seen with podcasts, as we we're also seeing with audiobooks, it's a market that requires specialized investment of time and energy. But like I said, is there a shorthand that's emerging in your experience where you look at a book and you go, "Hey, this seems like it'll do better in audio than in print." Yeah, you know, it uh, it has emerged. Mm -hmm. So there are times when I'm reading a particular book and I know that this will really work beautifully as uh, as um, as an audio book. It might not, you know, this is something that publishers right now maybe are not looking at, mm -hmm. uh, or this genre is not going to work uh, in print. Or, you know, because one knows what's happening, right, with every publisher. There are, in fact, four or five books that are actually signed on only for audiobook rights. Right. So, uh, and also uh, looking at different languages for audiobooks, not just mm -hmm. English. So we're trying to work on the, in different languages also. So, yes, that definitely has opened up a lot. And for, for older books, I'll say, like, as old as when we started Siahi and audiobooks weren't a thing. Mm -hmm. And if publishers haven't put out those books as audiobooks, then I'm actually requesting publishers that if you're not if you're going to work on it, perfect, no problem. But if you're not working on those or you know, not every book is being put out as an audiobook. If you're mm -hmm. not working on it, then we're signing addendums, taking the rights back and trying to sell those for the author because that's what we have to constantly do, right? We have to constantly right. be of service to our authors. So the, on all fronts, that's happening. There are there are books that have signed on only for screen adaptation as well, right? Because the the story lends itself like that, right? It's very interesting because again, podcasts have taken a slightly longer route to becoming prominent, but audiobooks have been sort of the bulwark of. Um, listening entertainment in India. Right? A lot of people have taken to audiobooks in a big way. And I would think um, that there are certain genres, there are certain types of content that do far better um, in audio than in print. I mean, from my untrained eye, I would say stuff that's in horror traditions often tends to do uh, very interesting work very interesting, uh, yeah. in, in audio than, than on, on the page. Um, let me ask you this as we sort of wind this episode down. Um, Mita, have you seen in your time um, with the last 15, 17 years while you've been running Siahi, any sort of uh, sort of a progression in the perception of Indian writing around the world, right? Has there been sort of a, a, a clear schism in, in time, in, in style or content or language? Um, that wasn't around maybe when you started, but now that's sort of the expectation when it comes to uh, maybe brown voices uh, in writing. What, what's that journey been like? Or what's that uh, so compare and contrast been like? That's a very interesting question and a very difficult one to answer. Because uh, I always say that there are seasons even in writing and publishing, especially right. globally. Uh, there was a time when Indian fiction was doing really well. Um, now suddenly it's non-fiction that's picking up. You'd be surprised the amount of children's books that are coming out by Indian writers internationally. Mm -hmm. um, there are audio books being picked up by Indian writers, whether fiction or non-fiction, in a big way. Um, obviously, you have the stalwarts like Salman Rushdie or Kiran Desai or uh, Chitra Devakurni Banerjee, whose new book is just out, or a Janice Pariyat, whose new book is just out in the UK. Um, there are so many such names in fiction, like Arundhati Roy will never stop selling. So these are like the, the stabilizing agents is what I call them. I mean, I right. hope they don't take umbrage to what I'm saying, but with due respect to each one of them, I love all of them. Um, but so there are, you know, it's kind of existing in pockets and then suddenly from somewhere you'll see a bright spurt in Indian poetry being recognized mm -hmm. or you'll have someone like Siddharth Mukherjee, whose books in this field of medicine and science and are really like the rage. Mm -hmm. 
or in Atur Gawande for that matter. So there's no one definition as such sure. that I can tell you that, oh, yes, right now we are the flavor of the year or something like that. No, as I say, it comes and goes in different genres for different people in different regions. You know, like Adevdath is doing very well in countries in the Southeast Asian market right. or even in, in East European countries. I don't know, for some strange reason, but it's working. Right. So yeah, but... there, there, there is like there's a constant smattering of something that's happening. We are constantly in the news. We're constantly making some noise. But to say particular genres or particular kind of writers, that is a bit like also, listen, there are so many countries. It's difficult to yeah. encapsulate one definition, you know, it is. It is. No, I hear you. I think um, there is so much to to keep up with right and and it's something that's happening definitely happening in writing it's also happening in in film it's also happening in music there's so much there's a lot of recognition for um, like i said brown brown voices putting creative product out there uh, but i'm i'm glad to know that the way you see it is that it's seasonal right and there is uh, no one stream there is uh, a particular year maybe a moment for uh, for poetry, a particular moment for fiction, and like you mentioned, uh, non-fiction or or more more factual writing, uh, doing the rounds itself. As I wind this down, um, I want to spend a moment talking about stuff you've written, and um, like I mentioned right up at the intro, there's uh, the effort, which is a food book, a memoir, and a travelogue, um, and uh, the anthology of essays on food, chilies, and porridge. What's the food tarka in your in your writing? Where does that come from? I love cooking. Right. I love experimenting. I love feeding people. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And I've been, I've, I'm trained as a journalist. Right. So for me, long form feature writing, long form research, um, all of that just comes as second nature. Uh, I feel most comfortable writing about food because, uh, yeah, I'm constantly on the lookout for what's happening with this. Why aren't we doing this? Can we, can we create something which is just like from simple ingredients? And mm -hmm. there's always a story, right? There's always right. a story. Especially when, even if you're looking at our own cuisine, uh, there's, there's always some myth, some function, some festival twist, something which is always fascinating. Just look at family traditions. Right. So there's always going to be some interesting anecdote. Okay, oh, you know, I was trying to make this, but then this particular got thing got burnt and I turned it into that. Right. So it's it's a creative process. For me, it's, it's therapeutic also. I can be as tired as anything but if you go and ask me okay will you bake something or will you just make a simple you know scrambled eggs for us like can you do it the french style with butter and cream and i'm happy to i'm happy like there are so many times when we've eaten out at some marriages when you have to show your face there mm -hmm. we we come back and we just eat simple and ki bhuji at home right you know so you're even if you're tired, it's fine. And for me, it's it it is energizing, and I love telling food stories, and I love discovering new flavors and new ingredients. And uh, I, whenever I travel, I'm always I think uh, there's a big joke that a uh, suitcase to iske pattern, bhande, sauces, herbs <laughs> ke liye alag se, you know. So yeah. I love it. I think it's, there's, like you said, there's just so much storytelling to food, right? There's the the background of the ingredients. There's the alchemy of the process. There's the experience of consumption. There is the emotion of sharing. There's just so much that you can you can talk about when it comes to comes to food, right? And it's it's not just about being, um, you know, being being sort of analytical or, or historical about it there's so much personal experience that yeah. comes in as well um i i read the first few chapters of of uh, of the effort where you're talking about 
um, introducing food to your daughter and your experience with it and her yes. point of view on it as well, which is very interesting. Um, I mean, I, I'd urge my listeners to go check it out. I think there's a very uh, interesting point of view that you've brought through um, in your writing with food. That's uh, super interesting. Thank you. That's very sweet of you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode, Mita. I had a ball talking to you. Uh, it's, I mean, my some of the favorite episodes that I've done um, on the show are with people who have, like I said at the top of this episode, been called out as the best at what they do, right? And what I love about talking to to folks who've done what they've done for for you know the better part of two decades is there's such a simplicity with which you present your wisdom. And that is something that that stays with me as I record this. And that's something that stays with my listeners as well uh, when they hear it. So thank you so much for, thank for joining. Thank you. That was very generous of you to say. Uh, I don't know anything else but to be simple and direct, frankly speaking. But um, yeah, I hope, um, I hope I could answer all your questions properly. But thank Absolutely. you for having me. Thank you so much.